Hi everyone and welcome to our lab number four. Today we're going to focus on chi-squared analyses and probability, which means yes, you have to see numbers and math. I know students hate that, but today's lesson is very valuable. Okay, it, it sounds very complicated when you see it in textbooks or when you hear it elsewhere, but I'm going to try and break it down into a few easy steps for you. And you'll be able to do a lot with these formulas and this information that we go through today. So when we talk about chi-squared, there's a few terms that you need to know that kind of help ease you into the practice problems. The first one you hear a lot if you've ever taken biostats or any kind of statistics class, and that is the null hypothesis. And whenever you're doing any of these crosses in class, you would normally kind of start off with a null hypothesis. Now, I know a lot of times you're used to hearing hypothesis, but you kind of may not have heard this, this term before. Now, I want to circle this right here. This is H with the subscript zero. Uh, so it's H zero null hypothesis is what this stands for. It's not saying ho, okay? Just in case you, you see it in writing elsewhere, <laughs> okay? Now, when we have a null hypothesis, the null hypothesis is generally always the same. What it is is saying there is no significant difference between expected and observed results okay in your in in your experiment so there's no significant difference between expected and observed results So whenever I ask for null hypothesis, you would say, oh, the null hypothesis is that there is no significant difference between expected and observed results. And you can even then specify what those expected and observed results are. Now, we're going to go through this when we do the practice problems, but I do want to point out an important point to make is when you see expected results for these crosses, well, how do you get what you're expecting? by doing Punnett, Punnett squares, right? Okay, so you get expected from the Punnett squares that you know how to do. Now, once you have your null hypothesis and you're kind of starting to think about expected and observed results, you then move on to the chi-squared. And the purpose of that is to use your chi-squared formula to get what's called a p-value. Now the p-value is important because the p-value will then tell you whether to reject or fail to reject your null hypothesis. Sorry, it reflexively wants to erase when you do that symbol with the touchscreen pen. So now notice the p-value is saying that the p-value that you obtain will tell you whether to reject or fail to reject the null hypothesis. What is it not telling you? The p-value will not tell you to accept the null hypothesis. We're just either rejecting or failing to reject that hypothesis. If we needed to, or if we wanted to accept the null hypothesis, we would then have to do further experimentation and tests, okay? So you formulate, whenever you have to do chi-squared, you first formulate your null hypothesis, then you use a formula to calculate chi-squared, 
and you use that chi-squared value to get a p-value, which will then tell you whether you can reject or fail to reject that initial null hypothesis you had. Now, when we say chi-squared, what we mean is this formula here. Chi-squared is equal to symbol, okay, sorry, the touchscreen keeps wanting to automatically delete things, epsilon symbol, and then we have O minus, sorry, the pen keeps acting up, O minus E squared, and you put that on top of E. And now when we do that, okay, that epsilon, so I'm gonna over here put your little key for terminology, okay? That epsilon symbol means sum of, okay? So you could think of that as sum meaning addition, okay? Then, O, what do you think O means? Well, in our null hypothesis, we said expected and observed. So it makes sense that O means observed. So the observed number of flies in a category. Okay, so observed is the observed, sorry, O is the observed number of flies in a category. And then that leaves you with E. And what do you think E is? Well, we mentioned observed. So now we have to mention the expected, expected number of flies in a category. And again, how do you get that expected? from a Punnett square, okay? And that's gonna make more sense as we go through the practice problems. Now notice that when we wrote epsilon, we said that that means sum or addition, but we only have one fraction written there, right? Well, the sum will be that you do this fraction for each phenotype, okay? When you have a cross. So for instance, in a monohybrid, you have two phenotypes. You have the wild type and the mutant. So you would do that fraction two times and add them together. Now we're going to do full um, examples of this so you can kind of understand it a little better. Before we move on to the examples, there's just one more point I want to make. When you see that O minus E, on the top of that fraction, um, sometimes you'll hear this called deviation, okay? I won't refer to it like that, but sometimes just in case you're reading a textbook or anything, deviation, because you're basically seeing, well, how much did I deviate in my observed phenotypes or observed offspring from what I was expecting? Okay, so we're gonna go through an example to kind of help you visualize exactly how to do this. If any of the terms we discussed on this slide uh, is causing you any trouble, you're uncertain, just send me a message in Remind and I will help you out, okay? So now we said with chi-squared, okay? Ultimately, we want to come up with a null hypothesis we want to calculate a chi-squared formula, get that p-value, and then determine whether or not we can reject or fail to reject that null hypothesis. Now notice, when we made the null hypothesis, we made it that there is no significant difference between expected and observed results. So basically, the whole point of doing this chi-squared analysis is after you've done a cross with the fruit flies, you want to see, did you get what you were expecting? For instance, in monohybrid, you always hear that three to one ratio, right? Well, how do you know how successful your monohybrid was at the end of your cross? Well, you kind of want to see how close did you get to that three to one ratio? So that's why the chi-squared, we make that null hypothesis 
that there's no significant difference between expected and observed results because ultimately we want to see was there a difference between expected and observed results? Did we not get the three to one ratio for that monohybrid or whatever we were expecting? Okay, so if you're going to do this kind of analysis, the first thing you do, you set up your cross with the flies, and then ultimately you get to count those offspring. So in the example we're going to use to tackle chi-squared in five easy steps, I know I sound like an infomercial, uh, the example we're going to use is you set up a monohybrid cross in terms of apteris, looking at the apteris mutant. Now, when we say that, what kind of flies are we looking at? What, what is the, you know, apteris phenotype? What does that actually mean? Well, we're looking at the trait or the characteristic of wings. And apteris means that we're looking to see, do the flies have no wings? Do they have wings? Okay, so wild type have wings, apteris do not. So you cross the flies that have the genotype plus A and plus A. Well, what are those? They're heterozygous genotypes, right? And they both look wild type. When you cross those two flies, you then counted offspring as 250 wild type little flies and 150 apteris flies in the offspring of that cross. So when you mated those two heterozygous wild type flies, you got the birth or the creation of <clears throat> 250 wild type little babies and 150 apteris little babies. And as you know, they're not actually little babies. They go through the egg and larva and pupa and adult stage, okay? Now, when you want to do chi-squared, the first step you have to do is do the Punnett square to get the expected results because we already know what we've observed. But now we need to do a Punnett square to get the expected, those E values. Okay, so we're going to look for expected results. So you're all experts at the Punnett squares by now. You make your big square. You put the gametes of each fly on the side. So we said our cross was plus A fly and plus A. So plus A fly and a plus A fly. And this is the standard. Sorry, the pen is acting up. So I'll just erase that for you. The standard monohybrid cross. Okay, so you end up with the usual expected phenotype ratios of three to one. Now keep in mind, we're, when we talk about expected and observed results, we're talking about phenotypes. And the phenotypes, you're already experts at knowing what phenotypes are. They're wild type, they're apteris, and in other crosses, there are things like sepia, white-eyed, yellow-white mini. All of those are what we mean when we say phenotypes. So when we look at this Punnett square, we are expecting, sorry, the pen is acting up again. We are expecting three quarters of the flies to be wild type and one quarter of the offspring flies to be apteris, meaning no wings. Now, when we look at our monohybrid cross that we did in the example, you notice that we saw 250 wild type and 150 apteris flies. That means that the total number of offspring that the cross yielded ultimately was 400 flies. <clears throat> and again, the way you got that, in case when you're watching this, you, you don't realize it's the 250 plus 150 offspring flies. So 
if we want to know how many offspring we were expecting to be wild type and how many we were expecting to be apterous, all we do is multiply the expected fraction by the total number of flies that were created in this cross. So expected to do expected wild type is three quarters of the 400 total flies. So you were expecting 300 wild type offspring to be born. For the expected apterus, you're expecting one quarter of the 400 offspring to be apterous. So you are expecting 100 apterous flies, okay? And you could think of this in English mathematics, you know, the using the English language and math. Whenever you say, you know, of, notice I said one quarter of 400, you know, three quarters of the total offspring, that tells you multiplication, okay? So in order to get expected, you do a Punnett square and you multiply the fraction of each phenotype by the total, okay? So now we get to everyone's favorite step out of the five steps because it is the easiest. So you notice that in step one, we calculated the expected uh, number of offspring for each of our phenotypes. But when we first introduced the idea of chi-squared, you notice it wasn't just expected in that formula. What else was there? The observed number. So step number two is to note the observed values for each of your phenotypes in your problem. And so in our problem, we have two phenotypes. We have wild type and apterus. And what do you notice? The observed numbers are right in the question itself, okay? So the observed number of wild type from this cross is 250. The observed number of apterus from this cross is 150. Okay, nice and easy step. Now comes the more annoying step, the step that students usually find more annoying, which is to plug in your values into the chi-squared formula. Now, just as a reminder, what did we say the chi-squared formula was? Well, chi-squared equals the sum symbol O minus E squared over E, okay? So now we're gonna plug that in knowing the expected and the observed values. And like I said, you go by each phenotype, okay? So the first phenotype we'll do is wild type, okay? And we say, how many wild type flies did we observe in the offspring? 250, it was right in the question. And how many wild type offspring did we? Well, we expected 300 because we expected three quarters of our 400 little baby flies to be wild type. So the observed 250 minus the 300 expected, and we square that, so there's not gonna be any ultimately negative numbers, and you put that over the expected, which is 300 again. <clears throat> now, we said that chi squared is epsilon, O minus E squared over E, and we said the epsilon symbol means sum meaning addition. So this first fraction only represents the wild type flies, but in a monohybrid cross, you have two different phenotypes, right? So now you're gonna add the values for apterus. So for the apterus flies, 
How many did we observe? 150. It's right in the question. Then we had already calculated the expected to be 100. We square that and we divide by 100 because those both of those 100s represent the expected number of Apteris flies. Okay. And then once you do that, you can either, you know, usually use a calculator or you can draw it out. So you say chi squared equals and you draw out that that's the um, 250 minus 300 is minus 50 squared over 300 plus 50 squared over 100. Okay. Ultimately, that should give you 8.33 plus 25, which is equal to 33.3. So now we have our chi squared because that 33.3 that you just saw is our chi squared. So now we can move on to step four. And step four, you have to determine what your DF is. And DF stands for degrees of freedom. And I know it sounds scary, but all it is is the number of phenotypic categories minus one. And again, remind yourself, what does phenotypic mean? What are your phenotypes? Well, they're things like wild type, apteris, sepia, okay? Those terms that we've already talked about. So there are usually two different types of crosses that you're working with in genetics lab with the chi-squared. It's usually your monohybrid and your dihybrid. So what would the DF be in a monohybrid cross? Well, think about it. How many phenotypes do you have possible in the offspring of any monohybrid cross? You have two, right? Either wild type or mutant, okay? So that's two phenotypes. So for that one, it would be two minus one. So the DF in a monohybrid cross will be one. In a dihybrid cross, now instead of just having wild type and the one mutant such as after is possible, think back to our dihybrid cross that we did when we were looking at wings and eyes. Well, we had the offspring could be wild type, they could be just Apteris, they could be just sepia, or they could be the double mutant. So they could be sepia apteris, okay? Or some people call it apteris sepia. Either way, there's the wild type, there's individual mutant one, individual mutant two, and the double mutant. So in the dihybrid cross, you have four possible phenotypes. And so to calculate the DF, you would do four possible phenotypes minus one. So the DF in any dihybrid cross will be three. <clears throat> the last thing to mention is think about our own example here. So in our example, we had a monohybrid cross, right? We had the phenotypes being wild type and apteris. So the DF in our example would simply be one, okay? If you have any trouble understanding anything, just send me a shout out in the Remind app, please. Okay, so now we get to the final step. I know it seems took so long to get here, right? You put in so much work and then you are finally at step number five. And what step number five is, I'm going to switch over to pen mode is you will use your chi-squared and df to find the p-value, okay? So use chi-squared and df to find p-value. And what p-value means is the probability value. Now, we already in our previous steps calculated that the chi-squared in our example is 33.3. And the DF in our example is equal to one, okay? 
So what we would do is you're always given a table and on the table, you will try and find your p-value based on the chi-squared and the df. Now I want to point out when you're using the p-value the, the table, all of these numbers here are df values. So the ones that you're usually going to be using are either the 1 or the 3, because 1 is the df for monohybrid, 3 is the df for a dihybrid. Then all of the numbers up here that I'm circling right now, these decimal numbers that are all lower than 1, those are the p-values. And notice the p-value always has to be lower than 1. And I'll explain that in, in a minute when we kind of relate the p-value to being sort of like a percentage. So when you see 0.995, that's like 99%. 0.5% probability. And now if you had a p-value of 1, that's like saying 100% probability. You can't go higher than 100%, okay? So you won't see a p-value higher than 1. So we see our df, we see our p-value, and then all of these numbers in the center, all of those are chi-squared values, okay? So when you want to use this table, the first thing you do is you find your df, which we said is 1, so we're looking there, and then you scroll across until you make it to where 33.3 would be. And what do you notice? The, the chi-squared values are getting bigger, but we can't find 33.3. So what does that tell you? That tells you that your p-value would be off the chart in this direction, 33.3 tells you that, sorry, it cut off, but you know that I wrote 33.3. That tells you that if you're then looking up to see what p-value it matches with, it tells you your p-value is off the chart as well. Now, what do you notice? The chi-square values, as you went left to right, the chi-square values got bigger. What do you notice about the p-values as you're going left all the way to the right? Well, we start with 0.995 over here, but as we go across, they're getting smaller. So if you're looking at a p-value that's off the chart to the right here, that tells you that it would be less than the last number that you're seeing. Okay, so our p-value for this example would be less than that last number that we saw, which is 0 0.005, okay? Last number of the p-values that I'm circling here. Our number would be to the right of that, which means less than 0 0.005, okay? Now, when you use this chart, there's a very important number that I want you to keep in mind in statistics, and that is a p-value of 0 0.05. So whenever I look at one of these charts, the first thing I do is I put a big red square around the p-value of 0 0.05 and all of the chi-squares that correspond with that. Okay, the reason that number is so important is that when you end up with a p-value less than 0 0.05 and less than, remember, p-values get smaller as we go to the right, so this would be p-values less than 0 0.05 okay, any of those, then you would reject your null hypothesis. Okay, so reject null hypothesis. Anything greater, so p-values greater Then 0 0.05, which is all the values to the left of that 0 0.05, then you fail to reject.
Now notice we said before you're not accepting, you are failing to reject the null hypothesis when your p-values are above uh, 0 0.05. Now keep in mind, in our example, our p-value was less than 0 0.05. So we rejected the null hypothesis. So what does that mean? That means we reject the idea that there is no significant difference between expected and observed values. So if you are rejecting the idea that there's no difference between what you saw and what you were expecting, if you're rejecting that, what does that mean? That means that there likely was a difference between expected and observed. And if you look at our numbers in the examples, you, you can see that, you know, you didn't get 300 and 100. You, you got quite a bit different from that, okay? So that's kind of how you can, can kind of think of the, the final result when you're, when you're analyzing your p-values. Okay, so in step five, make sure you always remind yourself what your chi-squared was what your DF is, and then you look up where your chi-squared would fall on this table, and then wherever your chi-squared is, you go to the top of that column, and you ask yourself, okay, that column at the top, the p-value is this value. And then the final step in any chi-squared, you always wanna ask yourself, is my p-value less than 0 0.05 or greater than. Okay, so I want you to imprint that number in your head. P-value 0 0.05. If your P-value is less than that, you reject the null hypothesis. There's quite a difference likely between your expected and observed. And if your P-value is greater than 0 0.05, you fail to reject your null hypothesis. And odds are, what you got looks very similar to what you were expecting, okay? If there's any questions, if you're having trouble reading the chart or understanding what we did on here, because I know, you know, it's not, not as easy to see maybe as if we were in the classroom. So just send me a remind message, take a picture of the slide that's giving you trouble, and I'll try to clarify it step by step, okay? So now that's it for calculating the chi-squared and analyzing it. You have the five easy steps. I just want to give you a little bit more information on kind of how you can think of the p-value and kind of why less than 0 0.05 is rejecting the null and considered significant. So when you think of the p-value, I want you to think of p-value as a percent, okay? Even though p stands for probability, you can think of it as percentage. And basically what this means is, if you repeated the same experiment, the same cross several times and your p-value is 0 0.25, then you could think of it as, okay, 25% of the trials would exhibit chance deviations from the initial trial. And when I say chance, that means that any deviation you're seeing is simply by chance, okay? Whereas a p-value of less than 0 0.05 means that the probability is less than 5% that, um, basically less than 5% chance that the observed deviations are from chance alone, okay? So if it's saying that there's less than a 5% probability that you're seeing kind of deviations from expected based on just chance, that means something else is at play, okay? That means that there's a reason for the difference. And that tells us that the deviations are significant. Now, I want you to circle, star, highlight the term significant, okay? Because when we do chi-squared, anytime the p-value is less than 0 0.05, we say that the, the results are significant. Okay, so you can even, you'll see in publications in scientific papers, that's when they say there's a significant difference between, you know, expected and observed.
the reason they're allowed to say significant is because they did the statistics and the p-value is less than 0 0.05. Okay, you don't want to in the sciences say significant if you haven't, you know, done the analyses and seen a p-value less than 5%. Okay, so I know that that's kind of uh, sometimes a little tough to kind of kind of think about you know, what the p-value actually means. I'm not going to test you on the the concept of repeating several times and what's by chance, what's not. I'm going to test you on doing the chi-squared and actually analyzing, you know, your results of a cross based on that. But on this slide, what you do need to know is the term significant and make note that if a p-value is less than 0 0.5, you then use the term significant, significant difference, okay? So in addition to probability in the sense of the p-value or probability value, probability can also be used in our genetics lab to determine the chances of any specific set of outcomes, you know, amongst a whole bunch of different possible, you know, activities or events. So, for instance, we use it to figure out the chances of having a specific number of sons and daughters or a specific number of wild type versus aptors offspring uh, with regard to the crosses that we look at. So the first thing you have to ask yourself, well, in order to do this, what's the probability formula? Now, when you look in textbooks or, or online, usually they write probability as P equals n factorial, which is the explanation point. I'll mention what that means in a minute. s over s factorial, t factorial, and then times a to the s power times b to the t power. Now, when I look at that formula, I say to myself, wow, that means absolutely nothing to me. How am I supposed to know what n is, what S is T, A, B, all of that. So instead, I'm going to put a square around that so you don't get it confused with how I like to write it is with actual words to remind myself as I'm writing out or doing one of these problems what I'm actually putting where. So I always tell myself that probability is equal to the total number of events factorial over the number of times you have option one okay, factorial times the number of times option two factorial, again, that exclamation point, and then you multiply that by the probability of option one to the number of times power times the probability of option two to the number of times power, okay? So again, we write probability is equal to the number of events factorial over the number of times you have option one factorial times the number of times you have option two factorial, and you multiply it by the probability of option one to the power of how many times you want that option, times the probability of getting option two to the power of how many times you want that option. 
Now, this all looks very scary and confusing when you don't really, you know, know what each of these things mean and you don't really know what factorial means. So I'm going to go through an example where we can kind of figure out what we mean by all of this. So let's calculate an example. This first example we're going to do is the probability of finding five males and two females if seven flies are born from a cross. Okay, so I'm going to write that here. Probability of five males and two females if seven flies are born. Okay, so we're going to use probability to figure out the chances of having a very specific outcome of events, being five males and two females. So as we saw with our formula before, we do P equals, and what's on top? The total number of events. Well, what's the total number of events here? How many flies are born total? The answer is seven flies born total. So you want seven factorial on top as the total number of events over the number of times option one. Well, what's the option one? Males, right? How many males do you want to see? Five factorial. So that represents males. And then we have option number two. How many times do you want option number two? Well, you want two females, okay? Then we multiply by the probability of getting option one. Well, if you are going to have a fly have an offspring, what's the chances that that offspring will be male, having the XY chromosome? Well, the only two options for that fly in this case in terms of chromosomes, again, we're not going into gender identification. This is strictly speaking based on chromosomes for flies. Um, if there's going to be a fly born, it's a 50% chance it'll be male, 50% chance it'll be female because those are the only two options. It's either going to be XY or XX, okay? So it's one half probability male, one half probability of female. So we would write half, and how many males do we want? Five, and then we write half, which is the probability of it being female. How many females do we want? Two, okay? And you can kind of remind yourself by writing underneath which option you're talking about, because you have option one and option two. Now, nowadays, you know, it's easy to just plug this into a calculator. Actually, it's not that easy. Students make mistakes with that a lot, even I do, because one wrong parentheses or whatnot, and it ruins everything. But if you want to figure out what this actually means and you want to try writing out what all of this means, well, let's break this down a little further. So P equals, and we say seven factorial. What factorial means is you multiply that number by each of the lower subsequent numbers. So seven factorial actually means seven times six times five, four, three, two, one, okay? And you don't include zero because if you multiply by zero, the whole thing turns to zero, okay? Now you put that over what's five factorial. Five factorial is five times each of the subsequent lower numbers, okay? And then what is two factorial? Two times one, okay? You then have your two probabilities. Now, when you have the same fraction for each of those probabilities, you can simply do one half and you add the two exponents. So five plus so we would just write seven up there, okay, to the seventh power. Now, when you have those factorials on top of each other, you can cross out what's the same on top and bottom. 
So having five times four times three times two times one on top, we then cross out the five times four times three times two times one on the bottom. And so you're left with seven times six on top and two times one on the bottom. Okay, so you can rewrite this as 42 over 2 times 1 half to the seventh power. And you can break that down even more because 42 over 2 is actually 21. And you could say times 1 over 28. Okay, and you can keep doing this by hand, writing all of this out until you get to 0.164, okay? Which again, nowadays you could just take our first formula that we had on the top of the page, plug it into the calculator, and the calculator should tell you 0.164 if you plugged it in correctly. And then to convert that to a percentage, because probability is the percent chance of something happening, how do you convert a decimal to a percentage? You just multiply by 100. Okay, so that's equal to 16.4% chance of having five males and two female flies born if seven flies are born in total. Okay, so now I know it made it scary and you probably tuned out when I was doing all of this by hand, but that was just to show you how you could solve this by hand. I will never ask you to do that. For me, I care more about you being able to plug the right numbers into the formula, being able to know offhand without me showing you a formula. When I ask probability of five males and two females, if you know seven flies are born, you should be able to know what is the probability formula and how would you plug those numbers into it, okay? I won't even make you solve for the final numbers or percentages. You just need to be able to recognize, okay, if I have the probability of this many males, this many females born to this many, you know, total flies, then I'll plug in this number on top, this one bottom, and, and recognize it in the formula that we see up here on the top. So I put a star by that formula, okay? So we're going to do one more practice before you get to... Um, the, the post lab and you start practicing on your own. So the other example that we can do when we do fly crosses, you know a lot of the times we're talking about the different phenotypes that you could end up with. So for instance, you know, in crosses is are the offspring wild type or sepia or wild type or apteris, things like that. So what we're gonna do for this example is the probability of two flies being apterous out of five born, sorry, erase that, And I'll specify the cross. So out of five born to plus a crossed with plus a parents. Okay. Now notice in this question, there are five offspring born, but I only asked you about two of the flies being apterous, which means what do you have to not forget to put into your formula? Well, if they're not apterous, what are they going to be? They're going to be wild type, right? So don't forget to leave, you know, to, to include the rest of the flies, okay? Your top and bottom numbers when you do the formula should add up to each other in the beginning part. I'll show you what I mean right now. So we're going to do P is equal to What's the total number of flies we're looking at being born? Five, don't forget to put the factorial. You put that over option number one, which is two flies being apterous, right? So option number one is two flies factorial being apterous. 
So what then is our option number two? If they're not apterous in this cross, they must be, what's the other option? Wild type, right? So if two are apterous, the remaining three out of five is what you want to be wild type. Now notice that the bottom numbers, two plus three, have to equal the top number of five. That way you know that you included all of the flies, all of the options that we're talking about. Okay, so now what's the, when, when you have that cross of plus A crossed with plus A, if you do the Punnett square for that, well, you know the probability of having wild type and the probability of apterous. I don't have to draw the Punnett square out for this particular example because you guys already know that anytime you're crossing two heterozygous flies in a monohybrid, you expect a three to one ratio in terms of three wild type or three out of four wild type and one out of four recessive. So the probability of apterus, because in this case, apterus is our option number one, the probability of having apterus in a plus a plus a cross is one out of four of those flies in the Punnett square. How many do you want? You want two apterus. Then you move on to your next option, which is wild type. And again, I always write the options underneath them so that I know I'm not leaving anything out. What's the probability of wild type in that Punnett square? Three out of four should be wild type. And how many wild type do you want? Three, okay? If you plug all of this into your calculator, you should then end up with a 26 probability of getting two apterous flies, three wild type flies in a plus a plus a cross with five total flies born, okay? And we can do this with anything. We could even do this with a dihybrid cross. The only difference with a dihybrid cross is that on the bottom, instead of having two options, how many phenotype options do you have in dihybrid? You have four, right? So if we do this with dihybrid, okay, which I can ask you about, okay, even though we're not going to do a full practice problem with dihybrid, um, I can ask you about that because you should be able to apply what you learn to go a step further. So I'll move the 26% up here, okay? If it's a dihybrid, cross, then you have four options that you need to have in your uh, fractions in your, in your probability. You have wild type, you have apterus, you have sepia, and you have sepia apterus, or sometimes again, you might see it apterus sepia, as long as both are written out. So you have the double mutant, okay? And so if you would do that, you would have P equals total on top, and then you would have wild type number factorial, you would have apterus factorial, you would have sepia factorial, and you would have after a sepia factorial. And then you would have the four fractions. Now, where would you get what these four fractions are? What do you know in a dihybrid? What is it? It's nine out of 16 to three out of 16, nine to three to three to one, right? When we did that big Punnett square, okay? Sorry. I'm gonna erase that so that it doesn't stay messing up your screen, right? So you would have nine sixteenths is the probability of wild type, three sixteenths the first mutant, three sixteenths the next mutant, and one sixteenth the double mutant, right? This is all stuff that we've covered before and that you've done in lecture. And then you would just have the number of wild type, number of apterists, 
number of sepia, and number of double mutants. Okay, so you can be asked to calculate probability for monohybrids, for um, sons versus daughters of flies, and even for the trickier dihybrid cross. Okay, and I'll include one of the dihybrid crosses in the post lab most likely, just so that you kind of show me that you understand the general idea and can apply it to that. Okay, again, please let me know if anything that we covered on this slide needs any further clarification. I don't mind going over it. Okay, it is now your least favorite time. I'm forcing you to communicate with me. I know I'm so horrible. It's so mean. You have to talk to the professor. Ugh, yuck. But anyway, we just mentioned how the probability formula can change with regard to questions about dihybrid crosses instead of monohybrid crosses. So that brings me to one final point about today's lesson for the chi-squared that we talked about earlier. The example that we went over in this video was for if you are doing a monohybrid cross analysis with you know, chi-squared, but you also have to be able to analyze dihybrid crosses with chi-squared as well. That's part of this genetics lab when we usually do monohybrid and dihybrid, you have to be able to analyze both. So now comes the point where I tell you to stop everything and in the Remind app, I want you to send me the answer of how you would have to change what we did about the chi-squared in our example when we were focusing on a monohybrid. What would you then have to do to convert that to a dihybrid problem, okay? So if I gave you a dihybrid cross result you know, I say, okay, you, you, you did a dihybrid cross and you got, you know, so-and-so wild type flies, you know, this many apterous flies, this many sepia flies, this many apterous sepia flies. How would this change what you're filling in to the chi-squared example, you know, that we talked about earlier, the chi-squared formula that we talked about earlier? Okay, so in the Remind app, Send me a quick message right now letting me know what aspects of our five steps you would have to change for a dihybrid example and how exactly you would then calculate that. Okay, and on the next slide, I'm going to give you a sample of what I would, you know, then want you to answer how you would do the sample. Okay. Okay, so as I just mentioned in the previous slide, in addition to you telling me and remind what aspects of the chi-squared analysis would change, again, keeping in mind the five steps that we talked about, uh, what aspects of chi-squared would change when analyzing a dihybrid, I also want you to send me how you would tackle this problem on this slide. And what you can do is you can take a picture of this slide and then draw on any piece of paper, write out, you know, how you would fill in the formula, what DF you would write, and then you can send me a picture of that. So you don't have to try and type things into the phone or type things into the computer. You can send me pictures when you're writing out uh, formulas and mathematical stuff. You do not have to solve the final answers if you want to. You are more than welcome to show me all of the work. But um, as long as what's most important to me, as long as I see that you can properly fill out the chi-squared formula, plugging in whatever numbers and values need to go where, and that you can properly uh, type in the DF number that would be used for this problem, and then you can verbally tell me if you want, oh, okay, so I would take, you know, the chi-squared and do this, that, the other thing to analyze this dihybrid cross. Okay, so when you get to these two slides, make sure that in the Remind app right now, you grab your phone and you send me how you would do these problems. If you have any difficulty or you don't understand what's going on, feel free to just tell me that in the Remind app and I will give you some further clarification and kind of walk you through this process, okay? Okay.
That is it for today's lesson. I know the stuff with the math students are not as fond of, but once you get the idea of it and once you practice, you know, step by step, it's not as complicated and scary as you might think. And like I said, I'll never have you solve on the quizzes or the exams for these type of things um, because, you know, I, I know that sometimes the cal calculators kind of can mess you up. Um, and also, since we're not in the classroom setting, it's a little more difficult when you're dealing with, you know, computer screens and post lab uh, typing in or quizzes that are multiple choice. OK, if you have any questions, concerns, if you're unsure of how I'm phrasing questions or how it can be formatted in, in the computer itself uh, in terms of what you might encounter on a quiz or post lab, just let me know in the Remind app. Please never hesitate to contact me day or night. I really don't mind. Okay, thank you and have a wonderful day.